Islands tend to be great reinforcers of allopatric speciation. Not only are the populations geographically isolated, the environment on the island can be very different and encourage more rapid changes in the alleles due to natural selection. So on islands, or this also applies to after mass extinctions, um, you can observe very, very rapid changes in the rate of speciation, mostly because of adaptive radiations from a single ancestral species adapting to fit many niches that are unoccupied by other organisms. So islands may not have as many organisms taking up as many niches, and obviously after a mass extinction you have a lot of different roles in the environment that were not occupied, and so you may see one organism take over and expand its characteristics to fit a lot of different roles. And each of these changes is, it's still a slight change. It's normally, you know, disruptive selection. It's, you know, changing from one thing to two slightly different things. And over time, you get this huge diversity. So we saw this when, um, on Hawaii, there were, there was a weed-like species but no trees. And so that one weed-like species, which on the mainland of the United States is only a weed-like grassy species, was actually able to evolve into woody shrubs and trees because they didn't have that competition. Um, Darwin's finches evolved lots of beak types to suit various food sources on the Galapagos. We've seen insects evolve into many different species based on food sources. Plants can change based on their pollinators. There are so many examples of this sort of speciation from moving into a habitat that has these new opportunities. Um, there's so many good examples and lots and lots of factors at play. So you just have to, you know, any example that gets thrown at you, you just have to kind of slowly sit there and break it down into its many parts that could be occurring. Sympatric speciation can often begin with a single population undergoing disruptive selection, just like I was talking about with the adaptive radiation. If you're an insect, for example, that selects its mating location based on the smell of a particular fruit or a particular plant where you were born, you're only going to mate with others born on that particular plant. So, you know, a parent insect may select that plant, lay their eggs, more members of that species will come back there, let, you know, mate, lay eggs there, but what if one is somehow attracted to a different sort of fruit? Well, now it's changing not only the type of fruit where it lays its legs, it's changing the mating location because if all of those young insects kind of imprint the smell of that fruit and that's where they return to mate, now you've got separation, physical separation for the mating location. So it might change the timing based on how that fruit grows and matures, and it's going to set up a lot of opportunities for prezygotic isolation because now you have this whole different group of insects. And obviously, I just changed a color just for an example, but that one change in egg-laying behavior was all it took to sort of start to diverge these populations into two different species. Plants commonly form new species in the same area by polyploidy. So you could have a single diploid individual. So here you can see the diploid number. I'm just showing you the chromosomes. Um, the diploid number is six. And by duplicating all its chromosomes, it could become tetraploid. So now that tetraploid individual has 12 chromosomes. And so it could possibly hybridize with the original plant, but then its hybrids would be infertile. They would have an odd number of every chromosome. But meiosis will work with an even number of chromosomes. So through self-fertilizing, because plants can self-fertilizing, it can make many offspring with the same tetraploid set of chromosomes. And botanists estimate that about 70% of flowering plant species came about from this sort of polyploidy. And remember, this does not require any kind of isolation, so it's another form of sympatric speciation. I'm showing you lots of examples of sympatric speciation because it's easier to kind of conceptualize 
being physically separated and becoming different species, but how to become different species when you're right there with other members of your population. That's, um, that's the really cool, odd, you know, that sets up the cool, odd situations. And there are lots more really fascinating things to learn when you're studying patterns of life that occur over the sort of time span that we're talking about when we're talking about evolution. So we've spent all of this lesson talking about how new species form through isolation, but at the same time, we have a world that is changing constantly, and it's changing in ways that could bring previously isolated species back into contact. And so that reintroduction could happen before the populations have become completely reproductively isolated. And so we're seeing that hybrid zones are forming. Um, and in some cases, um, well, we're just learning a lot about the species from these hybrid zones because you might see that the hybrids are less viable than their parents. And so if that hybrid zone is very narrow between the two overlapping species or it seems to be shrinking, where you don't see a lot of hybrids, even though they can mate with each other, you're probably experiencing some sort of um, post-zygotic barrier where those hybrids, you know, are showing that these populations really aren't that compatible anymore. Um, but if you see that both hybrids are thriving, then you might be seeing that those populations could still be considered members of the same species that are producing viable offspring and offspring with more genetic diversity, which is why they're thriving. And so in that case, that's when we start to change species names and we, we rethink the current classification of species. And this happened with um, mountain lions and cougars and all the you know large cats that were native to different parts of the United States. We found out that they were actually all different subspecies, but the same species. And so we've gone back and changed their species name so that the Latin name shows that they're actually all puma concolor. They're all the same species. So there's so much we can learn when, when these, you know, going out in the field and studying what's happening and trying to piece the puzzle together. Um, and these hybrid zones allow us an opportunity to take a look at that. And there is lots more cool stuff to learn, but that is it for today.